Father, we thank you, love you, and praise you, we exalt your holy name, we ask you to bless this time, bless our speakers, Father God, into a new process, and have your way, Lord God, open our ears, we will hear and understand what the scripture is saying to us, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor Joe, you ready? You're on? I think so. (laughs) Hey, David. (laughs) Tell about your church, where you're at, and where am I at? Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west, but from the Lord, is what the scripture says. So, But I'm the pastor of a church called Calvary Chapel. Um, my story is that I was uh, homeless, found Jesus in the midst of that. Um, I've slept all kinds of places being homeless. I've slept on... Uh, Steam grates. Anyone ever sleep on a steam grate? The problem with sleeping on a steam grate is you sleep on it to get warm, but it makes you wet. So (laughs) it works against you. Um, I found the Lord bouncing around the USA, um, hitchhiking around the USA. Somebody picked me up hitchhiking in the morning outside of St. Louis, Missouri, about 6 o'clock in the morning. I grew up in a tradition, fits into my story in the church, right? So I grew up in a tradition where I used to see Jesus on the cross. I would go into church as a young boy and see Jesus on the cross. And I always liked Jesus. I was always attracted to Jesus. Um, But as far as I knew, um, Jesus was dead. Because he's on the cross. So I always saw him. And, um, Is it Catholic Church? Well, I don't want to. Roman <laughs> uh, I always thought I, I thought he was dead. So, so I thought that if you were a follower of Jesus, that you followed his good example. That if you were a follower of Jesus, you followed his bravery. Um, if you were a follower of Jesus, you you followed him in, in justice and standing up for what's good and right, because that's kind of what I heard coming at me. I I never understood that Jesus had risen from the dead. And I met some people uh, when I was bouncing around the USA. They um, picked me up at 6 o'clock in the morning um, and they were talking to Jesus like he was alive. And it clicked for me. (laughs) It clicked. Jesus is alive. So, um, my story is, um, this is the area I'm from, born and bred in New London, Connecticut. Um, The day that I came to Jesus, I thought I want to go back to my hometown and tell my friends about Jesus. So I came back to my hometown uh, to tell my friends about Jesus, and none of them were really that interested at all. Um, But, you know, we started a Bible study in our house, and... um, gone from there. So I've been in ministry for almost 30 years now. Uh, We're in uh, the book of Genesis, right? Doing integrity. That's the one, right? Okay. So we're doing integrity. So if you have this book, I believe I have, is this the current edition? Mm -hmm. Yes. I have the current edition. Because I have two of these. There was a previous edition, wasn't there? Yes. You get three printed. (laughs) Yeah. So I have that one too. So so we're talking about... um, Joseph, which is uh, kind of fun for me because that's uh, that's my name. But what's the story of this guy Joseph and integrity? Because the topic for us today is is integrity. Um, but what's integrity, and what does it have to do with this guy Joseph? The the dictionary definition of integrity would tell you that uh, integrity means whole, it means to be whole. Like a whole number, not a fraction of a number, but a whole number. Not a part of a number, but a a whole number. So integrity means to be whole. So how does that relate to your life? How does it relate to my life? How does it relate to our life at work? Being whole, what what does that mean? It moves on a little bit, though, doesn't it? The definition of integrity where um, it becomes some personality trait that we admire because uh, somebody has a moral compass, 
uh, somebody has a moral compass, the direction they're going in, and they don't waver. Um, integrity means doing the right thing in a, in a reliable way. Um, I would say, summing all of those things up, I would say that integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So if you pay any attention to the news, um, what's happening now all over the place in the news is everybody's finding stuff people have said you know, privately in conversations and emails. And, and, and as everybody's been pointing the fingers, I've been thinking, I'm glad nobody's looking at my emails. <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder what would happen if a camera had been following me for the last 10 years. Um, uh, well, well, I wouldn't need to worry about that, would I, if I was a person of absolute, complete integrity? because it would mean that, that I've known for the last 10 years that I'm always doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Because that's what integrity is. Doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So if you're worried about people looking in your emails or following you around with a camera or trapping you with a, with a tape, maybe we should just do the right thing when nobody's looking. And then we don't need to worry about it. We'd be people of integrity. People of integrity. So. This guy, Joseph, when you talk about him in his life, like what's it got to do with integrity? At the end of the day, this guy is always doing the right thing when nobody's looking. He's always doing the right thing when, when nobody's looking. Who is he? Um, well, this account in Joseph, interesting that we would choose to study Joseph because it goes from Genesis chapter 37 to Genesis 50. And there's a little chapter in there that kind of breaks up his life a little bit. But it's, uh, it's one of the longest accounts, one of the longest biographies in all of the scripture, except for the gospel. Spent a lot of time on this guy, Joseph. And, and the whole story shows the sovereignty of God, the provision of God, the care of God. Um, this guy, Joseph, who we're talking about here, um, we find him as a young man. He, he had a lot of faults, um, yet he's a spiritual giant. He, he ends up really with a lot of integrity. He, his life is maybe like, like our lives. I, I would think that Joseph, the life of Joseph, has something for everyone. This guy, we'll talk a little bit more about building his biography, because how do you do 13 chapters in... 40 minutes, is that what I get? So what does that, what does that amount to per chapter? Um, this guy was loved uh, by his dad. He was ha hated by his brothers. He was favored by his dad. He was abused by everybody. This guy was abused. Um, this guy was tempted. And why wouldn't he give in to the temptations? The, the temptations that came at him, there were none of his family, none of those people that, that mattered to him in his life. Um, none, none of those people had any authority in his life. Why didn't he just give in to the temptation? He had integrity. He did the right thing when nobody was looking, right? That's Joseph. He was tempted, but he was also trusted. This guy, everywhere he ends up, people trust him. Everywhere he ends up, people trust him. He just has to be there for a little while before they're like, man, this guy, I can trust this guy. I can trust this guy with everything. Potiphar said, I can trust this guy with everything. I can trust this guy with my wife. I can trust this guy with my money. I can trust this guy with anything. So what am I when nobody's looking? What do my emails say going 10 years back? This, this guy was exalted. And he also abased. He was in the lowest places. And, and in all of that, he never takes his eyes off of God. He, um, he struggles. Uh, but adversity, trouble, doesn't harden this guy. And prosperity doesn't ruin him. Man. You know, that's, uh, that's a pretty good trick. I tell uh, 
I tell people when they're going to get married um, that the traditional vows say, I take you for richer or for poorer, for sickness and in health, for better and for worse. And when I tell them that, I go, you know, you don't know, you don't know what's crawling around in your body. You don't know for sickness and in health, and maybe, maybe you'll have health for a long time, maybe you won't. You have, you have no idea, there's no guarantees. Um, for richer or for poorer, Nobody can guarantee you that you're going to get richer. Nobody can guarantee you're going to get poorer or that you're not going to get poorer. But then I tell them, it says for better or for worse. I tell them I can guarantee you this. One thing I can promise you, it will get worse. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it will get better. It will get better. It will get better. So, so this guy, right, this guy is the same in private as he is in public. He's the same in private as he is in public. That makes a person great, doesn't it? The same, he's, he's whole. He's whole, like his life is whole. He, he has integrity. He's, he's the same at work as he is at play. He's, he's, the, he's the same with the guys as he is with the girls. He's the same with the girls as he is with the guys. He's just, he's just the same all the time. Um, he does start out a little self-consumed. Um, Joseph, did... Do we have our Bibles? Do we bring Bibles? Yes. Yep. We'll read at least the opening verses. I'm reading out of the New King James. That's my Bible for this year. I get a different translation every year. So this, this one is uh, the New King James, which may or may not be hard to follow along in. Um, it says, Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Well, that doesn't really help us if you don't know who Jacob is and if you don't know who his father is. So we'll tell a little bit about that story. Well, here's the history of Jacob. Okay, good. Good. So we get to know a little bit about this guy named <coughs> Jacob. Jacob is a dad. Here's the story of Jacob. Joseph, his son, was 17 years old. And he was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilka and the sons of Zilpa, his father's wives, plural, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them, to his father. Now, he was polygamous, right? He had multiple wives. Uh, but in the 21st century, it's not uncommon to have the same sort of situation. It's just that that men don't have the same wives at the same time. Like, like many people have gone through, you know, two, three, four marriages and, and have children from all of them. Well, that's the situation. You have here a blended family. You have a blended family. I do a little bit of marriage counseling and I tell people, you know, blended families are great, but blended families are work. And blended families are hard because, because you're bringing in, you know, two different ways of thinking and two different families family values. So, so that's the way it was here. This guy, it's life in the blender for him. There's um, same dad, different moms. Same dad, different moms. Is anybody, is anybody aware that if you have same dad, different moms, uh, it's, it's work, it's, it's difficult, it's trouble, it's not impossible. It's, uh, it, it, can, it can work well. Well, his father is Jacob. So this guy, Jacob, is this guy Joseph's grandfather, right? He's a, he's a grandfather. So, so uh, Isaac's father, I'm sorry. So um, uh, th this guy, um, his dad, his dad is a deceiver. His dad, his dad plays games. His dad plays head games. His, his dad plays lying games. Um, and, and, and he was a deceitful brother. Um, he, he deceived his brother. And, and so some of this stuff passes down through families, but it kind of stops with Joseph. It kind of stops with Joseph. Um, you have this sort of frustrated thing going on in the <coughs> family. If you read the accounts, you have to go pat, you know, prior to, to verse uh, chapter 37 to find the family. But you got this blended family, so we get the idea with that, right? Here's this kid in his blended family, but, but his dad, his, his dad, likes him and his mom. That makes sense? His dad likes him and his mom. 
And so that creates some trouble, right? Because he's got these other, these other women, these other moms, and, and he likes this one, and oh man, like, that can get a little crazy. So he lives in a little crazy situation. But, but is that any different than the situations we're living in? I don't know what your family is like, my extended family. When I go to Thanksgiving, in all of our extended families, everybody comes. I sometimes look around the room and try to figure out who's who. And then they go, so that's his mom, but that's who she's with now. And those are his kids. Are his kids living with? And I, and I can't, anybody else? Yeah, you, you, have, you have that situation? A lot of us. Um, and it, you know, it's, so it's not unusual, his situation, you know, situationally to us, it's not, it's not necessarily unusual. And in the midst of that, this kid, who's gonna grow into an adult, in the midst of all of that family craziness, it's gonna end up maintaining his integrity. He's gonna end up maintaining his integrity. He's gonna forge a path in his life where he's the same all the time. And he's reliable, and he's honest, and he's trustworthy. Even though he comes from the, the pressure of that family. So let, let's read on a little bit so we can get the story and learn a little bit more about his in, integrity. Now Joseph loved Joseph more than all of the other children because he was the son of his old age. Jacob loved Joseph. You said Joseph loved Joseph. Oh, I did? <laughs> Oh. Oh, I guess he did. Joseph, at this point, Joseph does love Joseph. He's still, he's still young. He's still a little bit of a self-consumed braggart. Okay, so yeah, so, so he loved Joseph uh, more than all the other children because his son was, uh, was the son of his old age, and he made him a tunic. He made him a coat of many colors. So here's what we do in our church. We teach people the sound of that. So when we say, now, now he loved Joseph more than all of the other children, you're supposed to go, uh, uh, so here we go. And so now he loved Joseph more than all of his other children. Uh. <laughs> Not good, right? So what's going to happen with the other children? How are the other children going to react to Joseph without even reading ahead? How are the other children going to react to Joseph? Jealous. Yeah, jealous. See that? So we don't even have to read ahead. We just already know, right? So, and then he makes him a coat of many colors. This is the ancient world. In the ancient world, it's difficult to make anything of multicolor because you need dyes, and the way to get those dyes, they need to be extracted from plants. They need to be extracted from snails. And so it's very difficult. And so he makes him this coat that's pretty valuable, and he sets him apart so that the other brothers all the time are reminded. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his other brothers, they hated him and couldn't speak peaceably to him. It was that hard to imagine in blended families and these situations? Is it hard to believe that that would happen? Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. There's the sound, what's the sound effect for that one? So here we go. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers. <laughs> and they hated him even the more. So he said to them, please hear the dream that I dreamed. He says, there, were, there we were, we were all together, and we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheave rose up above yours and stood upright, and indeed, your sheaves stood all around me and bowed down to me. How do you like that dream? <laughs> oh, man. How do, they, how do they like the dream? Oh, what's the sound effect? <laughs> all right, do that one. Let's try it. So, uh, uh, and he said, here's the dream that I, that I, that I, that I had. Uh, so, indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to mine. <laughs> <laughs> And his brother said to him, what? Are you going to reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? 
So they hated him even more because of the dreams and his words. And then he dreamed another dream. And he told it to his brother. And he said, look, I dreamed another dream. And at this time, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. That becomes a picture of Israel in other places in the scripture. And so he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him. And he said, what? What did you dream? Are you saying your mother and I and your brothers? Because he had the, there's 12 of these boys, so it would be 11 others. So shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. The first image, the first dream has images of things on earth, but the, the second one has images of things in, in heaven. Um, everybody understood the imagery. Everybody understood the picture. They all understood what he was saying, that, that he had this dream that he was going to rule over them, that he was going to be above them. He, he didn't have the wherewithal to keep that dream to himself. Sometimes when you know something, you're better off to keep it to yourself. A few words about the coat. The coat's not a coat of a worker. This is not a worker's coat. It's probably longer in length and longer in sleeves than his brothers. It's white collar, not blue collar. Um, and his dad, his dad wasn't the most discerning guy either because he unduly and, un, and untimely exalts the boy above his brothers. And so, Joseph is probably just as wrong to wear it as his father was to give it in front of the brothers. And so he walks around like what I call the pretty boy boss, right? So he is. He's the pretty boy. He's the boss. Dad's going to let Dad's gonna let him be the boss. But he's, he's the kid. He's the kid. Not a, lot of, not a lot of insight, not a lot of discretion there, verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock at Shechem. They're working for dad. And he said to Joseph, Are, aren't your brothers out there feeding the flock in Shechem? Come on now, I'll send you to them. And so he said, here I am, I'll go. And he said, well, please go and see if it's well with your brothers and if it's well with the flocks. And then bring word back to me. They're out there working. Where's he? Where's the kid in the coat? Yeah, he's a little soft. These these guys work out in the fields under, under the stars and the moon. This kid's a little soft. He stays home with dad. So he sent him out to the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him. Uh, now a certain man found him and there he was wandering in the field. And the guy said, what are you looking for? And he said, I'm looking for my brothers. They're out here feeding the flock somewhere. And the man said, they departed from here, here before. And I heard him say, let's go over to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. Now when they saw him coming afar off, because they could see him in all of that color glistening in the sun, he was like a neon sign. And so when he's coming, when they, when they saw him afar, even before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. He said, look at the dreamers coming. Look, look, looky, looky, Lou. Who, look who's coming. Man, you know what? And what do you think they're saying? I mean, if you've ever, you know, been in circles where people talk about things like that, you know, you hear that. He better not come over here. He comes over here, I'll tell you what he's going to get. Yeah, come on. Well, come together, they said. Let's kill him and throw him into some hole somewhere, some pit. And then we'll just tell Dad that some wild beast killed him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of, he, out of his hands, and he said, let's not kill him. And so the story is, they took him and they threw him in a pit. They threw him in a pit. And, and, then, they, and then they're eating up there, and he's, he's lying down there in the pit. Um, life in the pits. This is the pits. Um, you can learn a lot in the pits. You can learn a lot in the pits. Um, Moses got his backside of the desert degree in the pits. Um, Jesus often will enroll us in the school of suffering. It's good for us. And so, 
you know, we're sh we, sh it, we, in the modern world, we're, we're sheltered from many of the things that have made life difficult for people throughout the ages. You know, I mean, we have lights, we have shelter here, you know, and we have uh, you know, machines that keep us warm. Um, these guys here, difficult. So, um, so then the cover up. They, they throw in the pit, and these guys come, these traders that are going to Egypt, and they've got camels, and they're going to go down there and trade. And, and these guys, they said, you know what? Rather than kill them, why don't we just sell them? Why don't we just sell them as a slave? So these Midianite uh, merchants come through, they sell their brother. And then they take his coat, they put blood on it, they bring it back to their dad. And they say, Dad, you know, is this, is this your son's coat? Oh, yeah, 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 that's my son's coat. They, they lied to their dad. So let's look at the character of the brothers and the character of Joseph. The, the character of the brothers, um, they lied to their father, they lied to their mom, they lied to their sisters, they lied to everybody. Um, they're leading a lifestyle of deception. You reap what you sow, right? Well, um, this guy, he ends up in Egypt. He ends up in Egypt, and a guy buys him. A guy named Potiphar buys him. And uh, this guy, Potiphar, um, he realizes that this guy's got integrity, that you can trust this guy, that you can trust him with anything. And he trusts him with everything, including his wife. He leaves him alone with his wife. And his wife, she's going after Joseph all the time. Joseph, Joseph, come here. And he's like, I ain't going. He said, Potiphar's given me everything. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't hold anything back. I'm in charge of everything. I'm the steward of everything. I am not, I am not, I am not. And so she is not keen on him spurring her advances. Potiphar's a, Potiphar's a man of the world. Potiphar's busy. Potiphar's out there all the time. Potiphar's not paying any attention to her, apparently. And she wants some attention from this young kid, and he spurns her affections, spurns her advances. And one, one day, she's trying to, Joseph, Joseph, come to bed, Joseph. No, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and she grabs his coat, and he, run, he runs off. It's cl his Coats and cloaks are always going to be in trouble, by the way, this guy. Um, Potiphar's like, what? It seems like Potiphar didn't really believe her. Because the, the power of life and death was in the hand of Potiphar. He could have done anything he wanted to do. But he, um, he gets him thrown in jail rather than taking his life. So, so this guy, Joseph, why didn't he just sleep with the lady? Who's looking? Who cares? Who's going to find out? His family's not there. His family betrayed him. His brothers turned against him. There he is in Egypt. He's been sold as a slave. This lady wants to sleep with him. Why not just do it? Because he has integrity. This guy's the same when nobody's looking. When nobody's looking, he's the same. He has integrity. Um, he gets thrown in jail. There when he's thrown in jail, what do they do with this guy? All of a sudden, they recognize that this guy's trustworthy, that you can put this guy in charge of things. And so there he is, he's in the prison, they're putting him in charge of things, putting him in, 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 in control of things. And, and what happens in there? Some guys have a dream. The, the butler and, and the baker have a dream. And Joseph interprets it for them, and he tells them what's going to happen. He tells them one of them's going to lose their life, the other one's going to be exalted. And, and he told the guy, he said, when, when, you, when you get out of jail and you're exalted to your position with Pharaoh, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Tell him I'm down here. I'm innocent. Don't forget me. All right? The guy says, all right, I won't forget you. When he got out of jail, what did the guy do? He forgot him. He forgot him. So um, Joseph uh, maintains his integrity. Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. He has a dream of these cows. These cows. Um, and... And, and then these other cows come, the lean cows come and, and, and eat them up. And then he has, he has a picture of you know, you know, grain as well, and, and, and it comes and it devours it. And he's like, what is that? What is that dream? He's bothered by the dream. He, he feels like it's some supernatural dream that, that God or the gods are speaking to him. And, and he, doesn't know, he doesn't know what to do with it. And, and the guy who had been released from prison, he said, oh, I know a guy. I know a guy who can interpret dreams. And so he goes and he gets Joseph. 
Joseph interprets the dream for Pharaoh. He said to him, what that means is that there's going to be, there's going to be seven great years of harvest in the country. And then there's going to be an amazing famine, a terrible famine, and it's going to be horrible. So what you need to do is you need to stir up all of, all of this food, start collecting food, start putting it in storehouses, you know, during the seven years where things are good. And then in the seven years of famine, you'll have plenty. And so Joseph started collecting that, you know, collecting the tax of, of all of the produce, all of the, uh, all of the livestock. All, he was getting all of the land. He owned everything. Joseph got everything into, into the control of Pharaoh. It's a family. He was exalted, and Pharaoh trusted him with everything. Trusted him with everything. So there's a famine, but his brothers, his brothers that threw him in the pit, they're still living up in the land to the north of Egypt. They're experiencing the famine too. And their father tells them, go down to Egypt. Go down to Egypt, and there you need to, there you need to get some food. And so when they come down, Joseph immediately recognizes him. He says, those are my brothers. Those are the guys that threw me in the pit. And uh, he struggles a little bit with it. He struggles a little bit with it. But he, he, he comes to the realization, and he, and he lets his brothers know, you know what? They didn't recognize him because he was all farrowed up, you know, with the hats and the coats. He always... Always coats. <laughs> Always coats. The makeup, the paint. And he tells him, I'm your brother. And, and what you guys meant for harm, God meant for good. What you guys meant for harm, God meant for good. And so this guy, all through his life, he maintains his integrity. He maintains his integrity. So what do you get about all of these crises in life, all of this pressure in life? We need to be the same all the time. I need to be the same in public as I am in private. Who's reading my emails? I need to be the same everywhere. If Joseph wasn't thrown into the pit and sold to the Midianites, he never goes to Egypt. Well, is that good or bad? Well, if he never goes to Egypt, he never gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Is that good that he got falsely accused? Turns out to be not so bad. Because if he's never falsely accused, he never goes to jail. Well, I don't think being falsely accused would be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And then you get thrown in jail for it? How bad is that? What are you going to do? I'm going to get bitter. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to start yelling at everybody. I'm going to, I, I ain't going to trust nobody. Well, Joseph still maintains his integrity in the jail. So if he never gets thrown in jail in Egypt, he never meets the butler. If he never meets the butler, he never meets Pharaoh. If he never meets Pharaoh, he never becomes second in command in Egypt. And he's maintaining his integrity all the way through this. He's always trustworthy. He's always reliable. He's, he's whole. He's the same in public as he is in private. That's why everybody trusts him. If he's never second in command, then he doesn't administrate all of the food during the famine. Well, you know, so he's got a big job so great about that. Well, if he doesn't administrate in the famine, then his family would perish. He saves his family. So if his family perished, there'd be no 12 tribes of Israel. If there are no 12 tribes of Israel, there'd be no prophesied Messiah coming out of Joseph's family. So if the Messiah never came forth, you'd have no savior. I would have been lost standing on that highway outside of St. Louis, 6 o'clock in the morning. And maybe the same people would have picked me up, but they wouldn't have anything to tell me. Mm -hmm. Just give me a ride to the next town, drop me off outside of Chicago. If the Messiah never came forth, you'd, you'd have no Savior. You'd still be in your sins. If Jesus never came into the world, the world would be without hope. Somebody said this, that God is too wise to be mistaken. He's too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand his plan, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. What we like to say is this. We tell this to the church all the time. You need to trust in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. You need to trust in the dark what you knew to be true in the light. Because the darkness is going to come. And when the darkness comes, you need to you need to hold on to that. Um, 
I was in uh, Managua, Nicaragua, and um, we were rebuilding houses down there after a hurricane. And um, when, when we take teams, we're going to take a team to Haiti in a couple of weeks uh, following disasters. We've been following disasters for 30 years, um, 25 years. When, when you take a team, you always want to do something that's fun, something that's typical of, of the area. And so in Managua, Nicaragua, we used to go up to the volcano. There's a live volcano in, in Managua. And you can go up the top and you can look down there and you can see, you know, that it's a live, it's a live volcano. Well, there was uh, the story with Nicaragua when we went there. there. There used to be a dictator there. He was, he was pretty cruel. Um, he did what dictators did. Uh, he would grab people who were dissidents who were against him. He'd just grab them off the street, throw them in a van, and throw them in his prison and, and torture them. And so that got overthrown in a revolution. And so his name was Samosa. We, we, we went down into one of Samosa's um, torture chambers. It was closed. And, and the guy that was, because uh, he was gone, and it was just, there was nothing there. It was just a shell of a place. But it was way down in the ground where the volcano was. And, and our friend, the pastor there, um, he said, you're going to love this place. He said, you know, let, let, let's go there. So we went there, and he showed us, and there was this spiral staircase that goes down, 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 down. You're just walking around in this spiral staircase. And, and you go down a little bit, and it gets pitch black. You can't see anything when you're going down these stairs. And so... So he's leading us down there, and this is in Nicaragua, and um, you can't see anything. And so people are like, Bob, Bob, you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. He said, he said, come on, come on, follow me. And, and people are like freaking out because they're like, this is weird, you know? <clears throat> and here's what Bob said. He said, just put your hand on the wall so you know where you are because it's weird walking like that in the dark. <clears throat> he said, just put your hand on the wall and follow the voice. And we got down to the bottom, and when we got down, down to the bottom, somehow or another, there was all this light flooding this place. And I never forgot what he said. I thought, well, that's it, isn't it? You know, just trust, just trust in the dark what you know to be true in the light. That Bob's a really reliable guy. That Bob's a trustworthy guy. And when he tells you to put your hand on the wall, although I was a little skeptical, I thought, this is Nicaragua. There would probably, might be tarantulas on this wall, you know? <laughs> but, but you trust Bob. Right? Just put your hand on the wall and follow the voice. Just put your hand on the wall and follow the voice. So what do you do if you're Joseph and you get thrown in the pit? Just put your hand on the wall and just follow the voice. You know, what about, you know, when you get thrown into to, to jail, you know? In, in, integrity. The same thing in private as I am in public. That I can be trusted. That I can be reliable. That I'm the same thing. When, when nobody's looking, I'm the same thing. Um, one more experience I had, this, this is my own sort of struggle with integrity, and I don't think I'm the most integritous person. I think that we're all trying to grow in our integrity. But uh, I saw a pastor friend of mine crossing the street one day, and this guy, he has this booming prayer voice, like this hallelujah prayer voice, just amazing. I always thought, man, what a voice on that guy. And I saw him crossing the street, and he said, hey, Joe. And I thought, no, that guy's got like a little squeaky voice, you know, like, you know, that's not how he talks, that's not his big booming voice, and, and it made me just think about some things, not in judgment of him, but in myself, and I, and I thought, and I told my wife this, um, I said, you know what, I, I think I want to be the same all the time, I think I want to be the same all the time, like I want to really work on just being, just being the same, and she said, well, how does that work out, what does that mean? I said, I think I want to be as big a jerk in the pulpit as I am out of it. <laughs> he says, who I am? And so why should I, why should I hide that? Why should I? And, and she said, you don't want to be a jerk. I go, I know, that's the point. Like, I don't want to stand here and be a jerk. So, so I want to get my private life that you don't see. I want to get that together so, so that I really am this. And I've tried to live by that, you know. Um, integrity. Who's reading your emails? Who's following you around with a camera? You know, who's, you know, who's got tape on you? Well, I, I don't want to have to worry about it. I want to have integrity all the time. I want to live a simple life. Joseph is a great example of integrity. And, and Joseph gets job advancements. They weren't, they, they weren't so worried about his skills as they were his integrity. His integrity is what really bought him. His integrity bought him. So I think that's, I'm exactly on time, right? No time.
Is it right on the minute? Is it right on the minute? Yeah, very good. Well, really, uh, the 20 minutes discussion prepare those that are going to be interviewing.